When Mindy Johnson set out to write a book about the history, or as Mindy says, the herstory, of Walt Disney's definitively female ink and paint department, she began her research in the most obvious place, the Disney archives. I've been to the Disney archives several times. It's the epicenter of animation history, an enormous state-of-the-art research library and storage facility filled wall to wall with art from the past century of Disney animated productions. Mindy visited, requested everything they had on ink and paint, and they brought her a folder holding five pieces of paper. That's all they had. Composing the comprehensive history of any Disney division would be difficult even with the help of the Disney archives. Mindy had to start from scratch. Today she'll share stories from the creation of her epic work, Ink and Paint, The Women of Walt Disney's Animation, and introduce us to inspiring artists from animation herstory. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Oatly Academy Artcast. I'm Chris Oatly, director of the Oatly Academy and your host. I have two quick notes on today's interview with Mindy Johnson. First, special thanks to Oatly Academy instructor Micah Vinhofen for hosting such an amazing interview. I joined as co-host at Micah's request, but everything great about this episode came from Mindy and Micah. Also, you can find a link to buy Mindy's book, Ink and Paint, The Women of Walt Disney's Animation, at chrisoatley.com forward slash MJ1. That's M as in Mindy, J as in Johnson, and the number one, chrisoatley.com forward slash MJ1. And if you buy through that link, the Oatley Academy gets a commission that will support the production of this podcast. Now here's author Mindy Johnson. Can you begin by giving us an idea of how you became so sort of in love with research? So for me, it's kind of a quirky curiosity. For me, I've always been fascinated with the behind the scenes, those who are never usually in the spotlight and and how their contributions have shaped, formed what what we know and love, and following through on it. That's the the challenge. And vetting sources and being dogged about it, that was indeed the case with ink and paint. This had never been attempted before. I I guess I'm drawn towards real epic uh, evolutionary stories. When I first pitched the book idea to my editor, we both thought it would be this charming little (laughs) volume of tea cakes and tea breaks, and wouldn't that be fun? And I got (laughs) eight months into my research, and (laughs) I don't know if it was, you know, the tidal wave of of the immensity of this or what, but I I called her and I just said, this is a very different story. It cannot be a small book. It has to be a big Mm -hmm. volume because this is a big statement that has to be made. This is the other half of animation that we thought we knew, but turns out we didn't. Yeah. And the research still continues. So Wow. Yeah, it almost has this design semantics around it where the physicality of the book, like the dimensions and the, the thickness of the book is also an image for the contribution these women had. So it's sort of nice how that translates. Exactly. It was interesting, you know, while working on it, I wouldn't talk about it too much because I I learned quickly that I had a much bigger, broader, wider, more informed view of it than I could instantly convey to people. So when I'd say, oh, I'm working on my paint book, you know, found these great women, really cool discoveries. People go, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. And in their mind, they're thinking... Oh, pretty girls who are tracing color, tea time. Okay. Uh So I learned quickly to just not talk about it. But I think that's why I dug the company of the ladies, because it became sort of a, you know, you're one of us now. You you get it. You've been in the trenches with us with this. You understand why we don't talk about it, because the rest of the world doesn't get it. And and there was this collective hope by many of them that maybe they would understand it. 
Wow. So that was another real important drive. I wanted it to be a volume that they would be proud of and that they would uh, completely tell their story for them, you know, that for generations to come to know, yes, they had something to do here with this. And so you're absolutely right. Until it took that form, you know, I had done a number of presentations at D23 and would have the ladies speaking. And, and certainly by seeing the slides and the presentations, it started opening the door and the, the crevice and casting a bit of light on, on this to get people thinking. But until you hold the book in your hand and mm-hmm. you start looking through beyond the sheer size of it, um, mm-hmm. It, it, then it starts to sink in and really good point about needing to have that tangible tactile thing to mm-hmm. do or experience or dive into before people start to get it. I had a handful of images that were potential cover and I've had some men say, Oh, that's a terrible cover. You should put the jars of paint on the front. I'm like, Oh, oh you're missing the whole point here. <laughs> It's not what it's about. She's wearing great shoes on the cover, too. Mindy, how does one write such an epic <laughs> book? I mean, what if, what is the process like? Is that, as you say, a sort of discovery and journey? So is there sort of a back and forth between writing and research? Or does the research come first and then you do the writing? It was an interesting process. And... and And so going through every great, lovely book on my shelf, I'd go straight to the index and you would see the same five women. Right. Mm. Uh, Lillian and Edna Disney, uh, Mary Blair, certainly, Mm -hmm. Margaret Winkler, maybe. And they did talk about her. It was not always very positive, which Mm. was a complete that that's completely inaccurate. She did far more for animation than people realize. Mm. And then maybe read a Scott, mm. maybe. And in talking about the inking and painting process or where women were, you'd get maybe a sentence. So in going into the archives, I got boxes and boxes of things on the films and stacks and stacks of early ledgers going back to the very beginning. And I'll never forget, Kevin Kern came out to me and he said, I, I'm sorry, but this is all we have on ink and paint. And it was a folder that had five pieces <gasps> of paper in it. Oh, my God. So we all just sort of looked at each other and went, huh? Wow. (laughs) And it was that revelatory. I just said, okay, I get it now. Uh, That history is, in fact, his story. Oh. It truly is written about, preserved, documented, and archived from a male perspective. And that's Mm. why that's all we've ever heard. And it's largely been men writing about it. And Mm. we bought into this log line of pretty girls who trace in color oh they pulled women off the streets they put ads in the paper and took anybody they trained them yeah it's not that big a deal they were it's the animators they were just tracing and that's all it was so we had to start thinking peripherally we had to start thinking like okay how would a man archive this stuff you know catalog it what would they be looking for to try to find anything that had to do with the department okay Early celluloid came from DuPont. All right, let's see if there's a DuPont folder. Sure enough, uh, out we found two giant folders that had early going correspondence going back to the 1930s with Hazel Sewell on there, talking about, we are trying to do something that's never been done before. We need as much of the nitro, nitro cellulose that we can get. We are trying to do something that's never been done before. And based on our calculations, we think we're going to need this amount. (laughs) But we're in production now and we have a deadline and we need it now. And then you get letters saying, okay, you sent us celluloid that we've been working with a blue cast and this has a pink cast and it will not work for us. Our paints are mixed in such a way. So you start to realize, oh, the chemistry involved. The just the challenge, the rubric of the cell levels and how yeah. four levels of cell have a color cast to them. So the paint, if you're going to paint on one level, even though it's the same character, it has to be different on a second or third level. Then you realize the immensity of there's a whole other side to this art form we've never heard about. 
And then you start to get your head around, okay, and it's women, and many of these women, oh, got married, mm. and got married many times, and so their names changed. And fortunately, with the internet now, we do have Ancestry.com and other you know, public records that are now digital, mm. so you could do a much faster search. But even with that, there are still a lot of ladies that are requiring some traveling to get mm. some more new discoveries further fleshed out. Wow. Um, but then it's, you know, making the phone calls. Okay, if they've passed, are there relatives, are there children, grandchildren? Do they know? Do they want to know? Do they have materials? So everything is a little bit of a question mark. But I, I must say, many of these people, the minute I reached out, thank you. Thank you for telling our mother's story. Oh, thank you for telling wow. our grandmother's story. Um, we've had, you know, and I literally digging under beds and into closets and Banker's box filled with, you know, please, please tell our mother's story. So going through journals and love letters and scrapbooks and getting to know these women and their families was, I think, probably the most golden part of the whole journey. Just extraordinary people and artists who were so, so unsung. Uh, many of these women were remarkable incredible backstories and nobody knows this so in the midst of all of this research there was a real sort of enlightenment going on about okay now i get it why so many of my male colleagues just didn't want to go near trying to research about the women unless it sort of came to them because it it took that much more dogged research so i had sort of multiple pillars of my approach here uh, first of all, it had to be in their voice as much as possible. I'll do the research, but it's their story. It was also important to make this a drive-through experience of history rather than a rearview mirror experience. Because when we look at the fact that, you know, in the 1930s, they were making $13 a week. When we look at it from today's perspective, it's it's laughable. That seems just, you know, mm -hmm. slave labor. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. But when you look at what it cost. You could rent a, a lovely two-bedroom apartment in Hollywood here for about $17 a month. So a couple of the girls would get together and be roommates, and uh, you could buy a little car for a few hundred dollars. A loaf of bread was eight cents. Um, so you were doing quite well, and many of these women were breadwinners for their families. Shifting that paradigm in that time period was a major deal. There are timelines and peppered all throughout the book is the larger scope of where women were in history and pop culture events and, um, you know, fashion and, and uh, politics and world events that were shaping where women were, what the attitudes were, what they could or couldn't do. Right. <laughs> we still have challenges like that today. But so that became another important tenet of the book to really place it into this context of of driving through the experience of this herstory. And then the other one was to to really shift my thinking in, you know, there are so many great images and we almost default to that because of this unconscious gender bias and to become conscious of that and go, mm, no, nope, that's a great photo, but there's only one woman in there. So we're going to try to keep this strictly women. Mm. That's a lovely photo of Thelma Whitmer with five of the men in the background department, but we want to feature just Thelma. Okay, great. So let's find another image um, to really make a conscious choice. And again, that was my editor just saying, great, go for it. And the studio, once the company, once they recognized what was going on and the discoveries I was making, then they opened up and said, all right, let's get you to what you need. It was also a great discovery to learn just how progressive Walt Disney was, really, when it came to women and their roles. For a man of his time, he was also very forward-thinking in terms of women. I can't confirm that he is the first in Hollywood, but he certainly was one of the first men in Hollywood to say, if a woman can do the job, she gets mm. the pay. Yeah, I um, personally was really moved by Walt and Lillian's relationship, uh, Lillian, Walt's wife. Yeah. I mean, they, they seem to have been very happy. Yeah, very much so. They were devoted to each other. She really put her 
life's work into the company as well. She was supporting these guys in, in ways that, you know, people don't realize. Roy would say to Walt, you know, I think we're going to be tight on payroll. Can you have Lily hold her check? So she had a stack of checks sitting on her dresser she never cashed. Or sitting till the wee hours at the kitchen table working on cellulite and, and um, making those earliest Mickey and Minnie cartoons. It became apparent that there were strong women in his life all throughout. And he respected and appreciated and, and admired them and sought them out. And that really was a big part of where you see women coming into the company. He knew he needed a wider range of emotion, a wider range of sensibilities going into his storytelling if he was going to advance animation. You look at the earliest 30s and the beginning of the Silly Symphonies, uh, there's a, a new exploration of story, something a little more lyrical. but the early Mickeys and earliest Silly Symphonies, there's a lot of physical comedy, pratfalls, gags, sight gags. And he is on record in the earliest, I think it's about 31, as saying, I don't know why, but for some reason, women just don't seem to have the power to draw for animation. But when he, he starts to bring in Bianca Majoli, Grace Huntington, and other women in story, Dorothy Ann Blank, it's women. He brings in women artists knowing he needs their sensibilities. He needs their approach to story and pathos and other levels of emotion that can be explored and conveyed if he's going to pursue feature length animation storytelling because audiences are not going to tolerate pratfalls and sight gigs for an hour and a right. half. Mm -hmm. So he knew uh, I need to bring something more to it, and women have that. You mentioned that often these books on animation or animation history feature the names of five women in particular, and yet there are so many more. Who are some of your favorite previously anonymous animation heroes featured in the book? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> but Fantasia in particular is a woman's film, and so there are incredible stories of remarkable artist Mildred Rossi who did animation but also what was called color animation and I've actually had colleagues uh, male colleagues get almost uh, uh, abrasive about you can't use that term you can't call them animators I'm like well they're moving color wow yeah whether yeah. it's a pencil or it's a brush or a pastel piece they're moving color and that's what the women of ink and paint are doing as well and it's her pastel chalk work on Chernabog that you, when the lightning flashes, that's all pastel work done oh, by Mildred nice. Rossi. And I mean, that's the frightening, freaky part of that creature. And we've certainly associated and identified Bill Tyler's great work on that. But we also have to put Mildred Rossi in there and giving it the, the drama, the, the color, the, you know so many aspects of what's frightening about that character. She's a fascinating woman. She later went on to design the costume for the creature from the Black Lagoon. So I couldn't help but think of her uh, and her influence on the shape of water, not to give anything away there. But right. yeah, that's a woman behind it. You have the first person, male or female, to win an Academy Award for costume design, her name was Dorothy Jenkins. She got her start at the Disney Ink and Paint Department. Grace Huntington, who was the second female story artist at Disney, actually was an aviator and a pilot, and she held a world record in altitude. But she couldn't get a job in aviation because she was a woman. So she thought she'd try that other thing she was pretty good at. Turns out she was pretty good at it and got in at Disney. The first person, male or female, to have a syndicated column on aviation, Mary Goodrich, she later then, uh, as she grew older, uh, moved to California and started the story research department in the 1930s. Um, in a day and age when they did not have the internet to Google things, she literally would do all the research through things called books. And got the answers for what, you know, what does a 
a huntsman's costume look like and what would a castle look like in this time period and what would a cottage and you know what would a, a, a mine look like in this time period to do the research on the shorts as well as on the first feature length animated hand drawn film. Uh, and one fun little delight it was a lady by the name of Kay Sumner who was six foot three inches tall and she was a wonderful artist in her own right, studied art and, and got hired at Disney. While working on Snow White, the press came around and they built her as the, the giant girl who painted Walt's seven little men. And so at six foot three, she wrote a little article that appeared in the paper, sort of lamenting the challenges of being a very tall woman in this world wow. and not being able to see people eye to eye. Well, people read it and called her and said, can we meet? So a week or so later, she had five people in her living room she could finally see eye to eye with. Hmm. So they started going around and bowling and dating and having fun and so they started a little club called the Tip Toppers Club. Life magazine heard about them and came and featured them in the magazine. And suddenly people from all over the world were calling. There is now, still today, the International Tall Persons Club. And they give a, a scholarship every year in her name. She started this whole international club uh, in the 1930s while working at Disney Studios in animation. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, one of the many wonderful aspects of your book is that there are so many anecdotes. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> I loved the one uh, from animator Jack Kenny about the cats. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Then there's a sweet picture in there, too, where they're, the ladies are all standing around the cake celebrating Mickey and Minnie's fourth birthday. And you can see the cats climbing on the cake. Uh, <laughs> but when you think about it, the Hyperion Studio, and there's a photo of the three girls walking into the Hyperion Studios. And if you look at that sign, there's a giant mouse on it. And this is during the Depression. And so a lot of people just couldn't afford to keep their pets. Uh, so they would abandon their cats over the studio walls because they figured, oh, they have a giant rodent problem in there. So <laughs> the, women, the women took care of the cats and, and you know, that they became sort of studio mascots, plus keeping it free of, of unwanted critters. And then in Burbank as well. Do you have a favorite anecdote, whether hilarious or emotional? Dear Wilma Baker, she's uh, sort of woven throughout the book. As soon as I learned that she was here, still with us, a mere 97 when I met her, I could not get to her fast enough. And she thought, oh, yeah, you know, well, I don't know what I have to tell you. And I said, well, you know, I'll come down and we'll talk. And she thought, oh, it'll take an hour or so. Six hours later, <laughs> she was, you know, oh, gosh, I guess I did have a few things to share. And, you know, as women, we kind of take this stuff for, well, yeah, you know, you just did it. We don't, we're not looking for bragging rights or anything. And before I left, she said to me, she said, you know, maybe this will be something that my ch grandchildren and great-grandchildren will finally get to understand what I did. They called her the shadow girl. There were very few who could handle the shadow solutions and a real art form. And Wilma was one of them. She did every discipline. She worked in Xerox. She worked in checking. Wilma's story, if you read through, you'll learn she lost her husband. She was a widow. Uh, he was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And she was pregnant with their child. Wow. And he never got to meet his father. His, uh, her husband never got to meet his son. And so there she was, a widow at the tender age of, what, 24, 25, with a baby. How do I care for this? She called the studio. Can I come back to work? Yes, we'll help you. Come back. We'll help you with your child care. Who does that today? Wow, you know? yeah. So she came back, and she worked. Uh, she found a church that could help. She had some family that stepped in and helped with t daycare for the baby. And raised her son and met her second husband there at the studio, Ted Baker, one of the editors. Just an incredible story. Yeah. And no 
would have known that because she wasn't about tooting her own horn. Well, I got her out. She was at D23 a few years ago. I got her out speaking and talking. She got to sign autographs, but the book was still being formulated. And all she wanted to do was hold that book in her hand. And um, there were some delays on some ends. And I finally had it in a PDF form and I wanted to show her because I kept hearing her say, I really want to hold, I just want to hold this book in my hands. So I called her daughter and said, look, I've got it on PDF. I'd love to come show her. Okay, well, yeah, she's, you know, let's see. Let's get through the holidays. She's, you know, it's been a little busy and she's kind of slowing down. And I said, okay, well, you tell me. And within a matter of days, she was gone. Wow. So the family invited me to her funeral. I will cap this off by letting you know she was buried with a paintbrush in her hand. Oh, goodness gracious. Just... <sighs> yeah. Wow. There, there are lots of incredible ladies out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe that's even an encouragement to women, especially to be okay and even be proud of what we accomplish, right? Yes. As women, we may not instantly think that, oh, we should talk about what our experiences are, write this down and share our stories. Part of the problem with not knowing this past is we we tend to think it's never been done before. So we're the first or we're, we're inventing it. And yet it was already done. So we don't have this strong sense of past to build on. Now that we have this understanding, I just was down at the Festival of the Arts in Florida, the Epcot, this past weekend for the opening of that. And I finished presenting, and there was a sweet, amazing little, I would say, 10, 11-year-old clutching the book. And the book was bigger than she was. She was just this <laughs> little mite. And her eyes were just huge. And I popped over, and I said wow, you have excellent taste in literature. And she just, <laughs> I said, are you an artist? And she, yes. She just, her eyes got big and her mother stepped up and she said, this child had a very short Christmas list. It was your book. Oh, oh well done. I said, well, let me see. You know, are you an animator? Yes. So the mother, I said, well, can I see some of your artwork? Do you have it? And her mother pulled out her iPad. This kid had it. Wow. She was, uh, you know, her character design said, you, you've got, this is wonderful. I said, do you, do you do any story? Have you made stories for your characters? Yes. Flipped through the iPad. Here were her storyboards. And here she started showing me a little clip of one of her characters and the world she had created. And I was like, I said, all right. And I flipped to the uh, dedication page in the book, which is to our daughters, our mothers, arts animators and dreamers and i pointed to her and i said have you seen this she said well i'm halfway through reading the book i said good said did you see this page no i didn't and i said i wrote this book for you Hmm. and her eyes just got so big now mother started crying and i said no i'm serious you it's exactly you because you now can look at you have shoulders to stand on you have a way paved for you by these incredible women. And you can move forward knowing this. And you can go out and break the ceiling on directing and storytelling and studio Mm -hmm. owning and whatever it is you want to be doing, because you can understand that women have already been there. So I hope I didn't thrust too much on her little shoulders. This kid had it. If she stays focused with it, she's going to do it. That was sort of full circle for me because all the while working on it, I wanted that. I wanted the next generation and today's generations who are out there in the industry to finally say, oh my gosh, the mountain's been already climbed. Now I can go about landscaping and sculpting and focusing on my work for that mountain and what I want to be doing and move it forward. Who knows? Anything's possible. You can find a link to buy Mindy's book, Ink and Paint, The Women of Walt Disney's Animation, at chrisoatley.com forward slash MJ1. 
If you buy through that link, the Oatly Academy gets a commission that will support the production of this podcast. As I mentioned a few episodes back, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Artcast, we're improving and upgrading the show. If the Artcast has a special place in your heart, I'd like to invite you to our 10-year birthday celebration at chrisoatley.com forward slash 10. That's T-E-N. Join the special email list at that link, and I'll send you sneak peeks of our new name, our new album art, and our new theme music. And best of all, you'll receive an invitation to our 10th birthday party, which will be live online this fall. Again, just go to chrisoatley.com forward slash 10, that's 10 spelled out, T-E-N, sign up there and I'll be in touch very soon. Until next time, my friends, stay strong and stay close. Thank you.